Well, good morning. It's great to see you all. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you with great thankfulness that you have broken wide open this doorway of access to you through the cross and resurrection of your Son and by your Spirit. We thank you that your invitation to draw near to you is in response to your great efforts to draw near to us. We thank you that you are a God who is perfect in justice and goodness and therefore rightfully condemns the sinner, and yet you are a God overflowing with mercy and grace and kindness, and you have made this way for all the punishment we deserve to be poured out on Jesus, that we might draw near for you, to you forever. So we thank you for this moment of access, and we thank you for your word. And so we pray as we open your word here that you would powerfully work in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. You'd open our eyes to behold your beauty in Jesus, and you'd fill us by your spirit. Amen. Well, we've begun a new sermon series called People for the World, and this is about showing and sharing the love of Christ. It's a natural follow-up and next step um, from our sermon series in Romans 8. That was about receiving and enjoying the love of God in Christ. And so, as those who are filled up with that love, we now want others to get in on this. We want to show that love in our lives. We want to share that love as we speak about Jesus with others. So this morning, we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. So you can open with me in your copy of God's Word, Deuteronomy 4. If you don't have a Bible, there's some scattered uh, nearby under chairs and pews. And if you don't own a Bible, please take that one with you. We'd love for you to have a copy of God's Word um, to keep uh, for yourself. So we started this series a couple weeks ago with Israel's calling in Exodus 19. We saw Israel right after they came out of Egypt. They came to Mount Sinai. We heard that they were a people that were rescued by God to become a holy people for the sake of seeing more people saved. And so we're continuing their journey, and we meet up with Israel a generation later After the first generation failed epically, and now this next generation is about to enter the land, they're standing on the edge of the land of Canaan, this promised land, about to go in, and Moses preached a series of sermons to them. And Deuteronomy is collecting these, and it's one of the most important books in the Bible, and Deuteronomy 4 is one of the most important chapters in the book of Deuteronomy. One scholar called this chapter the theological heart of the book. Moses here clarifies how Israel is to live in the land and why it matters. So here's what he says. He says that when God's people wholeheartedly obey God, it attracts others to God. So we've heard people say, I like Jesus, but I don't like His people. But could you imagine a church that looked and felt so much like Jesus that people said, I don't know anything about Jesus yet, but I do know what you're like, and that makes me want to find out what Jesus must be like. That's the vision held out here. So here's the question for us. How can we live in our culture in a way that attracts people to Jesus. Yes, of course, many, of pe- many people will hate Jesus and reject His people. That's clear. It's always been that way. They rejected Jesus. Jesus said it would happen. But people were also drawn to Jesus, and people were drawn to the church. Many of you are here today believing in Jesus because you saw the power of Jesus at work in people among you. It's part of my story. Remember, my brother was invited to participate at church and in the youth group by a friend who was a Christian, and he saw a love he had not seen before, and he heard the message of Jesus, and he became a Christian. I started going to church, and I saw and felt the love of Jesus through people and heard the message of Jesus. So, 
Of course, people will reject Christians, but God's vision is for them to reject us as we are becoming holy like Jesus and loving like Jesus, not because of the ways that we're not like Him. So here's the question. How can we live in our culture in a way that attracts and draws people to Jesus? Deuteronomy shows us that this was God's vision for His people from the beginning. Now, you'll notice the first couple messages here in a sermon on evangelism, sharing the message of Jesus. We're not in the New Testament, and we won't be next week either, uh, because this is a theme through the whole Bible. This is where the whole story of the Bible's going. Our mission as God's people, as the church, is a continuation of God's plan from the beginning with Adam and Abraham and Israel, right through Jesus and now into His people. So, let's read Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 through 8. So, this is the introduction to Deuteronomy 4 as a whole chapter, which we won't get to, but we'll look at this introduction in Deuteronomy 4. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I'm teaching you, and do them, that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor shall you take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, so here's the response of the people, when they see Israel's life, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon Him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? So here's what this shows us. God's people, one of the reasons God's people wholeheartedly obey God is to attract other people to God. But what kind of obedience does this? Well, this text gives us three insights about obedience that we'll need if we're going to attract others to God. So, we'll see the humble posture of obedience, the cultural challenge of obedience, and the public witness of obedience. So, the humble posture, the cultural challenge, and the public witness. We'll see these as we just walk through this text we just read here. So, first, the humble posture. This is verses 1 and 2. Look at it again with me. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I'm teaching you, and do them that you may live, and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, your God, the God of your fathers, is giving you. So, do you see the very first thing here, even the, the very first thing in these two verses? It's not to obey. The first thing is to listen. Do you see that? Hearing in Deuteronomy is centrally important, and it's not just about letting words enter our ears. It's about letting them enter our hearts, the core of our personality. It's about internalizing God's Word. It's a posture of openness to God and what He says. It's the key posture of true Christianity, of a true Christian. Everything starts here. When you become a Christian, and to become a Christian is to have this posture, this new posture in your life of openness to God, rather than guardedness or stiff-arming God or being aloof from Him or distrust. It's a trusting, humble openness. We say to Jesus, when we become a Christian, I'm going to listen to you now. Listening to myself and other people, this isn't working. It's not working for them. It's not working for me. And I'm sorry, and I've rejected you, but I'm going to listen to you now. You are my Savior. You are my King. You're my friend. So, the first step is listening. The second step here is learning. Notice he says, listen to the statutes and the rules that I'm teaching you. 
So they're not just getting a list of commands. He doesn't say, listen to the list of rules I'm giving you. That's about to come. That's not the only thing that happens here, though. Listen to what I'm teaching you. Moses is teaching the people are learning. God has always given His people teachers. It's why education has been so important for Christians throughout the centuries. Wherever the gospel spreads, educational institutions pop up to educate people to be able to read God's Word and hear God's Word and live well in God's world and to raise up pastors and teachers who can study God's Word to teach it faithfully. And the focus here is especially on teaching to obey. You notice that? You know, Jesus picked this up again. It's right in the Great Commission, and it's the heart of Deuteronomy. Jesus said, baptize people, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. We're taught to obey. So this is why it's important for parents to teach their children as well. Our culture is very excited about teaching them to obey its new moral standards. The culture is discipling all of us into a way of thinking, feeling, valuing, and living all the time through music, through movies, through shows, through art, through slogans, through signs, through flags. And so we need a counter-education from God's Word. Christians can't expect to obey God without learning what He says. Press fast forward on where we are right now, 20 years, if Christians do not keep learning what does God actually say, this will not look good. The culture will have won the education battle in instructing to obey all that it commands. It is an alternate religion, it is an alternate ethic, and it does have teachers eagerly evangelizing and discipling a culture. So we just need to be aware that's happening and then say, okay, we're all going to be discipled. Let's actually pay attention to who's discipling us and why and who we want to disciple us. And let's pick the God who made us and loves us and who has infinite wisdom. When our culture agreed with a lot of Jesus' ethics, we didn't need to think as much about why does God command these things? Because no one was challenging them. No one needed to think, do I need to have a ready definition of what is a man? What is a woman? What is marriage? Ordinary Christians didn't need to make a case for these as wise and good, but now that's changed. And so we need to be learning and thinking, why did God give us these rules? Why are they good? Why is this wise? What is a man? What is a woman? What is marriage? And after listening and learning, the third step is doing. Verse 1 says, listen to the commands I'm teaching you and do them. So listening and learning is not enough. Jesus said, after he taught plenty of things, he said, if you know these things, he doesn't say, blessed are you. He said in John 13, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And then finally, we take it whole. So we listen, we learn, we do, and we take it whole. Here's what I mean. We don't pick and choose what we want to obey. We don't learn and then stand in judgment over what we learn from God's Word and decide what we actually think is wise and good for us. We take it whole. Now, you may be thinking, well, this sounds obvious, but this kind of picking and choosing and not taking a whole happens more than we may think. And here's how God put it in verse 2. You shall not add to the Word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I'm commanding you. So he says, don't add or subtract to God's Word. That's taking it whole. So what would it mean to add to Scripture? Well, it's treating your preferences and your traditions as God's Word. It happens when we harden our traditions and our preferences into stone. It happens when we love our traditions more than we love the people who don't obey them. It was a huge issue in the first century. Jesus confronted it all the time. It was an issue in recent generations with fundamentalism. The other danger here is subtracting from God's Word, taking away from it. This happens when things that God has said in His Word for us to receive, we overlook, we don't pay attention to, we dismiss, we decide that something's too hard to do, or that we won't be liked and accepted in our culture, and therefore we can sideline this or just dismiss it. 
So the issue here has been the problem with theological liberalism and progressive Christianity, treating God's Word like a menu. We get to look through it, thank you for giving us these options, and we'll pick and choose which ethical meal fits us today and that people in this restaurant would like, people in our culture would like. So what's the problem here? Well, what's the purpose of not adding or subtracting to God's Word? So what's the purpose of taking it whole? It's really obvious, actually. Look at verse 2 again. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, so that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. So the purpose of taking God's word whole is so that we'll actually obey, is so that we'll actually keep God's word. Now that, again, may sound obvious. Of course, we take God's word whole so that we can obey it. But here's the thing. When people choose which things they want to obey, they're often still claiming to obey God. They're maybe not obeying everything. They're maybe sidelining a few things, but they very often say that they're following God. And they'll say, well, everyone picks and chooses. Or, well, we've misunderstood that for 2,000 years. Right? They claim to actually obey God. But if you treat God's commands like a menu to pick from, Who are you actually obeying? You're obeying yourself, right? You're really the one in charge. You're just obeying the parts of God's Word that you already agree with. You're still the Savior and Lord of your life. And so what you've actually done is broken the heart of God's law because you've created an idol to worship. You don't have a God who can contradict you, and so you don't have the real God. You have a God that you've made in your image that fits your desires and preferences. You have an idol you've created in your image. So God is calling people to take His Word whole so they'll actually obey God. So God's calling His people here to have a humble posture of obedience. Not just to obey, but to have a posture of obedience, listening to God, ready to take what He says whole. So, to say that God is God is to say that you'll embrace His whole Word, you'll listen to it, you'll learn, you'll do, and you'll take it whole. Of course, we recognize that we can only limp along in obedience until the resurrection and the new creation comes in its fullness. No one's going to obey God perfectly. Jesus, though, did not come to exalt the righteous, but to forgive the sinners. And so, the question for you and me is, do we have this humble posture of obedience? Yes, we'll fail, but what's our posture? Second, the cultural challenge of obedience. Verses 3 and 4, Moses reminds them of one of the greatest challenges to obeying God. It actually happened very recently in their history at this point, and it was a moment of epic failure for many people in Israel, and it was because of a social pressure around them to compromise. So look at verses 3 and 4. I think when I, when I first read this, by the way, and I chose this text mainly for verses uh, 6, 7, and 8, and I've loved verses 1 and 2 thinking about this week. Um, verses 3 and 4, I was kind of like, well, that'll be a quick comment. Um, but as I was thinking about it, especially in light of where we are right now, it's incredibly relevant. So let's look at this together, this cultural challenge they faced and we do as well. He says, your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today. All right, so the story of what just happened there that they all knew when Moses said this was recorded in Numbers 25. So Israel was in the wilderness. The people of Moab around them invited Israelites to participate in their idolatry. And in Moab, idolatry was a very communal festive and sexual experience. So, it included cult prostitutes, Baal's the fertility god. The idea, in part, is to excite Baal to then spread his blessings over the land and reign. And they had sacrifices, and they're enjoying community and feasts together. And many Israelites participated. So, there was this incredible social pressure around them, and sexual temptation together. And some compromised, and God destroyed them. Others 
held fast. That's the language Moses uses here. Held fast, stayed loyal to God. Can you see that there's similar cultural pressures all throughout history and today? And this was an issue in the first century Christians. Read Revelation 2 and 3 with Jesus addressing these seven churches, constantly addressing the the pressures around them to participate in these cults that were around to offer sacrifices to the gods and honor the emperor. And it often was sexualized. And you had to participate in these things in order to have an economic standing and, and move up in the guilds. The social pressure with sexual temptation together there. And then certainly today. Our culture has sexualized our identity and made self-expression and sexual expression into a God. So, we're entering into Pride Month, which you can't miss, and we've seen it promoted as a religion. Our culture's chosen this um, over these past few years as uh, the most celebrated topic above all others. It embodies, it embodies, this is why it's so celebrated, our culture's understanding of self-expression. So, our culture, we're aware, we hear often that, or there's an, almost an unstated assumption very often that you find your true self by looking within. Your true identity is found in what you feel, especially your sense of gender and sexuality. So, look at your sexual desires, and then to be authentic, then you need to express that. And then everyone is being asked to approve and to celebrate it. So, there's together this increasing social pressure with sexual temptation. And so, there's a division happening, just as it was for Israel, between those who maintain a humble posture of obedience to God and hold fast to Him, and those who compromise. There's many reasons why Christians are tempted to go along with this. Some don't want to lose their jobs. Some feel bad for how Christians have been mean to others about this, and they have empathy and want to show love, which is a great thing and important and necessary to show love. Maybe some have experienced same-sex attraction, and they aren't sure what to do, and no one around them is helping them, or they're afraid of how people might respond, and they don't feel like anyone would help them listen to what God says and work out how that is expressed in their life to be faithful and hold fast to God. And one thing that makes it hard with Pride Month is this, that our culture's lost the ability to say, I love you and I disagree with you. So, disagreement is now seen as invariably hate or a lack of love, but that's just not true. And so, we need to remember that as Christians, we're called to do both of these things at the same time, to love people and honor them and treat them with dignity as those made in God's image. And no one steps out of that reality. We honor and we love people, and we lovingly disagree with them out of love for them and for God. One of the most helpful thinkers and writers on this topic uh, today, I think, is Sam Albury. I recently listened to a conversation that he had with a couple about this, and they each modeled what this humble posture of obedience looks like related to our cultural challenge. So, I just want to share a bit from this conversation. So, Sam, if you're not familiar with him, he was, um, when he was a teenager, he realized that he was attracted to men, and he didn't grow up in the church. He didn't know who Jesus was, really, or the gospel. And when he was about 17 years old, he became a Christian, and he became a Christian, and he didn't yet know what God's Word said about gender and sexuality. And so, in this conversation, he's talking to a married couple, a husband and a wife, and the wife was sharing that she had a similar experience as far as becoming a Christian when she was around college age, and she also didn't know what God's Word taught about sexuality. She didn't struggle, as Sam did, with same-sex attraction, but she was certainly interested in what does God think about sex? And, but she didn't know. And so, both of them have this story where they become Christians and they're curious, what does this now mean for me? What does this mean for my sex life? And here's what I loved. They both expressed how they were willing to embrace whole whatever they found out, whatever God said. And so, the woman said, uh, this was her thought when she became a Christian. She said, Jesus is so gracious, so loving, so kind. I want to follow Him. If He loves me like that, I want to follow Him. 
no matter what he says, I may not do it perfectly, but I want to do what he says. And then Sam said, and I didn't know what at this point he did say. I had no idea what his views on sexuality were. I just knew that I was going to follow him. And whatever his views were would be okay because it's him. Do you see how that kind of posture comes? Not merely uh, because there's a list of ethics that Christians offer the world, but because we ourselves have been captured by Jesus' love. And Jesus' views on sexuality are hard for everybody, right? Everybody has sexual temptation and needs to deny themselves to follow Jesus faithfully. And so they just model this beautiful posture. We can trust him, whatever he says. And so Sam came to understand that what Jesus teaches is very challenging. He found it very challenging for him as someone who has same-sex attraction, but he didn't question the goodness of Jesus. He said, I didn't necessarily like everything he said, but I like the guy who was saying it, and that was enough. So this is the humble posture of obedience in the midst of our cultural challenge. And that posture in the midst of our culture and our cultural challenge can be a powerful and attractive witness for Jesus. Certainly, not everyone will be attracted to this. There will be social cost. Sam himself gets it. But there will also be people drawn to Jesus, the real Jesus. So third, the public witness of obedience. God is commending this generation of Israel for holding fast through that cultural challenge they just went through. And now he's saying, as you continue to hold fast and you enter into the land here, you will be a public witness to the world. And one of the purposes of your obedience is to draw people to God. One of the purposes of obedience is to see other people come to know the Jesus that we've come to know. So our lives are to show that our words have credibility. We show the world that Jesus makes a difference. So look at the public witness in verse six here. He says, keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So God is calling Israel to be a display nation. They're to live in such a way that other people are attracted to learn about God. And notice that God doesn't say that people will be impressed by their military strength or their numerical strength or their intellectual strength, but their wisdom. So here's how we can compare Israel in the Old Testament to the church in the New Testament. Israel's life said, come and see. Come and see this great God and the wisdom he gives. The church in the New Testament actually continues that come come and see message, but adds to it, go and tell. So Jesus sends his people into the world saying, go and tell. Go to the nations, go to your neighbors, and tell them of the goodness of Jesus. But come and see doesn't stop. It's not just that we go and speak things. It's that we become communities of light all over the planet now, not just localized in one land with one city and one temple. God's temple spreads through the world in His people, and these little communities of light are all over. We're one of them. And so our calling is to go and tell and also say, come and see. Come and experience the life of Jesus among this church family. Come and see the kinds of relationships that are possible and life change that's possible through Jesus with imperfect people who have a posture of obeying God. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He prayed that our love would convince the world in John 17 that God really exists, that he really did send Jesus, that he really does love his people. So God's people have a public witness. And then notice there's two things that make God's people unique here. The nearness of God and the righteousness of his rules. So that his nearness is here in verse 7. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him. So that's the first reason why Israel's distinct, the nearness of God. No other people in no other nation 
and no other religion has a God so near. Not Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam or any of our new spiritualities. The God who made us is personal, and He's a God of love, Father, Son, and Spirit. And He comes to know us and invite us to know Him. And He draws near to us and responds to our prayers. He hears us when we call Him. And then second, God's justice is verse 8. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? So God's law wasn't arbitrary. It was a model for how a nation could live with righteousness and justice. Nations were to learn from God's people how to live with justice. Now, the law given to Moses and Israel was unique. It was for a unique people at a unique time, at a unique moment in redemptive history. So we don't just kind of take the Old Testament law and try to map it onto our lives one-to-one today or for any nation. But it gives a paradigm and principles as a reflection of God's character for how to live wisely in the world. And if you read Deuteronomy, you'll see God's passion for justice and righteousness over and over and over. There, there's a heightened emphasis on commands that deal with caring for orphans and widows, right? Single parents and sojourners in the land, refugees. There's a heightened sense of care for caring for the poor. So our culture cares a lot about justice right now, but in many ways they get some things right, in many ways they get it wrong. They don't know how to understand what true justice really is, and they often are unjust in their pursuits of justice. They rightly recognize that justice matters, but they often don't work for justice for the most vulnerable in our nation, including the unborn or the disabled. I had a brother who was handicapped, and I have firsthand witness and stories from my family of what happens when Tyler would go into the hospital and face medical staff who clearly did not think his life was worth giving the attention that they gave other patients. And it almost cost his life a couple times. It's an injustice. It's a not valuing the vulnerable or the elderly. Our culture is also emphasizing justice, but neglecting forgiveness and grace. But they belong together as they do in God's character. And this is really about reflecting that initial vision in Eden. In Eden, God was near his people, and it was to be a land of justice and flourishing and wisdom. Adam and Eve failed. God brings Israel onto the stage. And he draws near to them and gives them just laws. And they fail as well. In fact, one of the key points in the book of Deuteronomy is that Israel will, in fact, fail massively over the generations and eventually go into exile. But this was all, in fact, part of God's plan leading to Jesus, who would come and do it perfectly to live with justice as a light to the nations. And he came to be near to us. He came to model justice and grace to us. He took our sins and failings and injustices upon Himself at the cross. He restored this near access to God for all who come to Him in faith. He sends His Holy Spirit to be with us even this very moment working in our hearts as we consider His Word this morning to draw near to Him and to be transformed by His power. And Jesus will return to fill the world with righteousness and justice again as He renews all things. And now God's transforming His people to be a light to the nations. So if you're a Christian, you are being watched. People are looking to see if there really is anything to what you say about Jesus. Very often people have not been attracted to God through His people because His people have not lived attractive lives. Some have claimed to be Christians but have not actually known God's nearness. And they've not lived in his righteousness and wisdom. People rightly reject hypocrisy. But very often we do see people attracted to God through the behavior and lives of God's people. And it's happened for many of you. Maybe it's happening to you right now. Maybe you are in a season of life where you are exploring the claims of Jesus because you have seen a peculiar love and life expressed in other Christians you know. And maybe someone invited you to be here this morning, and you're open to exploring who Jesus is. Now, you may be thinking, but Jesus said the world would reject His followers. And we know that some of the most faithful Christians in history and around the world were persecuted. So, obviously, this is complex, but I think we just look at Jesus' life for the model here. Many people rejected Jesus, especially 
leaders, and many other people were drawn to him. And so he's calling us to expect the same results. We don't obey in order to get people to like us. We're not in control of people's responses. Whether or not people think Jesus' way is wise is not the reason why, or it's not what determines whether or not we think he's wise and whether or not we'll live this way. But we live for Jesus with this hope and expectation that God will work to draw people to himself through us. So this text is about how God's people can be a beautiful, attractive, surprising public witness in their culture, a witness to the nearness of God and the goodness, the justice of God. So God's people wholeheartedly obey God in order to attract people to God. So just a few quick uh, implications, just bring a few things together. So here's what we need. First, just to kind of rewind to the beginning here, a posture of listening. That's the core posture. That's where all of this starts. The church, a church that is an ugly witness for Jesus has a problem that starts here with a posture. They need a posture of, of openness to Jesus. It begins in our hearts. And that means, though, that there's hope for change because God is the one who gives this posture. He changes hearts. He can humble us. He can open our hearts. If you're not a Christian, this is the beginning. You turn to Christ and you say, I'm open. I'm giving up being my own Savior and Lord, and I'm going to come to you. And whatever you say, I'll do because I trust you. And for us as a church, we always want to keep this posture as a priority. And one way that you can tell this posture is a priority in someone's life or a family's life or a church's life is how much the Bible is open. Obviously not just literally sitting there, but is there a posture of opening the Bible and listening to God's Word? Like it's actually happening regularly. We're saturating ourselves in God's Word. We want to be open Bible people. We want to be an open Bible church. Second, a life of obedience. So we have a posture of listening, and then we have a life of doing. We take His Word whole. We don't add or subtract, and then we take action in our lives. So really practically for you, what next step of obedience to Jesus that's hard do you need to take? Have you been neglecting something from God's Word and His ways? Do you need to ask someone for help to make a change in your life, to stop looking at what you've been looking at on the internet, or to break off an inappropriate relationship with someone, or to have help getting rid of an unforgiving or a bitter or a resentful heart or spirit towards someone or people. So a life of obedience. Is there a step of obedience you need to take at your workplace? We live publicly in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, in our families. Do we need to confess to lying to a coworker or cheating in school? I had to confess that to a teacher once. It's a pretty rough day. Um, teacher was gracious, a Christian. Um, and I'm glad it happened. Do you need to confess to stealing something? I've heard of someone who wasn't a Christian, had a coworker known as the Bible guy, fired him for stealing. Not a good look. <laughs> Third, live publicly and live publicly together. One of God's strategies for reaching, God, reaching the world is the public witness of his people. He transforms us so that our lives would attract others to God. So some of you are really good at this. You have strategically, or maybe not even on purpose, it's just happened, you just find yourself around a lot of people who don't know Jesus. And so you get to live publicly among them. Others of you, maybe we're good at this for a while, and then over time, for all sorts of reasons, you found yourself in a Christian bubble. That can happen through actual obedience too, right? You're, you want to love Christians, you want Christian friends, um, and then you find yourself spending a lot of time with Christians, which is a good thing. And then you want to share the gospel with friends who don't know Jesus, and so you did that for long enough where some of them became Christians, and some of them rejected you. And so now you're around Christians. And so that's not a, a bad thing, but it's not ideal. And so what step do you need to take to begin befriending people who don't know Jesus again? 
um, and spending time. And part of this, because this is about living publicly together, maybe you have a Christian friend who does have a lot of people in their life who don't know Jesus. And you can hang out with them while they're hanging out with their friends. So much of what's needed is not just for people to see one Christian living wisely and according to God's Word and loving well, but they need to see how Christians treat one another. They need to get a sense of the family of God and the power at work in the community. So finding ways to overlap spheres and friendships over meals or um, other gatherings or inviting people here on Sundays or to your small group or having a barbecue. Fourth, live with love and justice. So verse 8 says that people should marvel at the righteousness of God's rules. People should see Christians as pace setters for pursuing justice. Again, they may not think that everything Christians do is justice because they aren't working with the same definition we have from God's Word, but they should see Christians living for justice. How we treat people in stores and restaurants matters. People are watching. Be kind to your servers. Tip generously. Love your literal neighbors well. Befriend them. Keep blessing even the most curmudgeonly neighbor you have. Make sure your coworkers know that you care about them. In light of Pride Month, don't compromise on either truth or love. Be unwavering with the truth and overwhelming and overflowing with love and compassion. Pursue justice for the unborn. Treat the handicapped with dignity. Reject racism and ethnic pride. Adopt and care for children who need a home, and so on. And then finally, invite people to know Jesus. As you live this way, some will reject you, but others will have an increasing interest in the God who made them and that who you seem to know and who makes a difference in your life. So find ways to talk to Jesus about them. Invite them to explore learning Jesus for themselves. Get them a good book that explores Jesus. Get them a Bible. Encourage them to read the Gospels. Stay in their life so when suffering happens in their life, they know they have a friend who will listen and care for them because you've just proven it over the years. So we could go on, encourage you to continue the conversations after the service, over lunch, in your small groups, pray for one another. Let's be about this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your brilliant beauty that shines through Jesus and that you are increasingly causing to shine through your people, though we often see how dim this is because of our sin. So we pray that you would continue to shine your light through your people in this world and that we would see in our culture a revival spread of awakening to you and your glory in Jesus and reformation among your people. In Jesus' name, amen.